So this is a quick talk about uh, ClojureScript, uh, but specifically it's uh, more of a case study on this one app that me and a colleague of mine built, so that's why his name is showing there. Uh, his name is John Andrews. He's a Clojure developer for a while, and he's been, uh, you know, he really loves Clojure, and he's been, uh, he's contributed to several open source libraries. Um, as a mess for me, um, I'm, my name is Chandu. Um, and I'm in between gigs right now. I'm finishing up working for a software consulting company. Uh, we do mostly Ruby and Rails and JavaScript. Um, and now I'm moving to another company that builds learning management systems. It's called Instructure. Really cool company. Um, and their front end is uh, moving from Ember.js to React.js and you know, coincides with my interests in React. Um, but specifically, uh, yeah, I've, I've been interested in ClojureScript for a while. Um, I've been working with Clojure and ClojureScript for a while, but ClojureScript definitely is the area that I'm most interested in. Uh, and then coming to this conference uh, has been interesting uh, with huge uh, contingent of Haskell programmers and Scala programmers. I fully expected something like this. Uh, this tweet showed up earlier today at a different talk, and uh, that's why a lot of crappy Ruby developers are now crappy Clojure developers. And I'm like, wow, I totally agree with the comment at the bottom. It's like, did they mention me directly or just describe me exactly? Um, <laughs> yeah, so, but yeah, that kind of does describe me. I mean, I've, I've been playing around with Clojure, uh, not, of, not a lot of other functional programming, but uh, I really enjoyed the way Clojure has um, and ClojureScript has helped me think, and it has informed uh, the way I write Ruby uh, and other languages. Um, so I'd like to talk about uh, this app that I made, uh, along with my coworker. Um, so the motivation for this app, um, so really quick, does anybody, is anybody familiar with birding or bird watching? Sweet, wow, awesome. So. You know, there's, uh, you know, when you're out, so for those of you who don't know, uh, bird watching is basically the hobby of going out um, into, the, into nature and just watching birds in silence, watch them in their natural habitat, and it's fascinating. And it's very, uh, you know, it's, it, it's very restful, very peaceful um, pastime. Um, and then most of the time when, uh, when you're out there, um, what you have is you know, your pair of binoculars and a field guide. And you know, so it's a really low barrier of entry. Um, so that's one of the things I like to do. And uh, you know, field guides look something like this. Um, you get a page of you know, quick descriptions of birds and then photos that match up with them and then small little maps that show you the rough ranges they're in. So, you know, and in, um, and when they're in season, you see all these beautiful markings on them. Um, you know, there's quaint names for them, like sublaurel, uh, you know, whatever markings, or wing bars, or uh, you know, rufous-sided, you know, breasts, or whatever. And um, it turns out uh, that when it's off season, it's really hard to tell those markings because they they don't, uh, the birds don't wear that plumage all year. Um, and also, uh, you can, uh, and since, you know, with Field Guide, you don't have audio, uh, you know, there's quaint little descriptions. I, I know you can't see from the writing there, and I have audio files, but I won't play them. Uh, so, but, you know, it's like the yellow warbler, for example, uh, the one on the left, is supposedly goes, sweet, 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 I'm so sweet. Whereas the chestnut-sided warbler, not to be confused with the yellow warbler, says, please, 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 please to meet you. So, you know, it's really, it, it's, it's, it's a tough job out there. Um, so, but, it, but again, it's a very seasonal thing. And uh, when, you're, when you're in the migration season, you know, the hot, hot time of the year, you know, several of these species are like, Flowing right through the through that hot spot, um, whereas you know off season it's like you have to look around and you you'll be lucky if you find a crow. 
and then you're like, oh, wow. Um, but yeah. So, so I thought uh, part of my interest was, you know, with, with ClojureScript, and uh, I was also interested in, uh, in D3 and mapping. Uh, and so I was like, okay, maybe if I can plot the bird migration across the US region um, on a map, uh, that would be a cool, cool project. So that's how it started. Um, basically, this is the app. So I'm gonna try and play this video here so that I don't um, tempt the demo gods. So it's a pretty simple app. There's an autocomplete where you can search for a bird species by name. Um, and then you can, it narrows it down for you. You can pick one. It, it shows you a picture if it can't find one. Uh, you can go from month to month. And if you look at the map, you can see where uh, the bird is kind of, you can see the bird sightings kind of move across the map. Now you can see it because this is the migration season. Um, and in June, which is the peak, they've already settled in the, in the area that they're gonna breed in. Um, so you can zoom in, you can look at the map closely, um, you can drag the map around, uh, you can and, and check out the populations of the birds. Um, and then you can keep going. Um, but then also, uh, the way it fetches those, uh, the photo is it uh, talks to Flickr uh, because I didn't want, um, you know, to st store bird images. I didn't, you know, that's not what I, the purpose of this app. So, but it, if it can match, find a match on Flickr, it links you directly to that, so that the photographer can get the credit, um, and and then you can browse other photos that that photographer has taken. So that that's the app. So the data for the app. Um, so there's this, there's this portal, those of you who birded probably have heard of this, it's called ebird.org, and it's this uh, massive uh, crowdsourced you know, warehouse, data warehouse of uh, bird sightings. So people who are out there who are you know, really diligent birders, and I'm unfortunately not one of them because it's a lot of work, uh, but what they're doing is noting down uh, what species they've seen how many of those, uh, what other species are around with it. Um, and this helps eBird kind of, you know, make intelligent uh, reports about, you know, bird, bird populations in general and, and look for trends and such. But, you know, they have a huge, huge amount of data. Um, so, and what, what's cool is they make some of that data available for, for free down, or like for academic use. Um, and so I, I reached out to them and I was like, you know, could I have some of the data uh, for maybe, how about one year's data for just the US region? Um, any ideas how much data that was? So it was uh, about 11 gigs of uh, text. You know, it, it was just these tab separated values. It was a huge one big file. Uh, they gave it to me after three days. Um, and uh, they generated it, and uh, I downloaded it, and then I'm like, wow, what do I do? So there's like over 1,700 species, and this is just for the US region. It doesn't even, it's not even North America, right? So it, it became clear that I needed some kind of, uh, some kind of API, um, because this, this is not the kind of data that you just throw into your browser and you know, expect it to work. Um, so, so, uh, but then the API needed to be uh, such that I could I could quickly import it in uh, import that something that's not exactly developer friendly uh, format, um, and then, like I said, too much data. And then also, since since the idea of the app is fairly dynamic, I would I was I was like maybe it's a good idea to have an API that gives me data on demand, you know, rather than so-so for specific things. I need to be lazy about it. I need to be, you know, I need to focus it down so that I'm only fetching small bits of data as I need it. And thankfully, there's a very basic uh, JSON request API for D3, the JavaScript library. 
Um, so with that, you know, I know that I can hit a server somewhere and, and get some data. Uh, so this is where you know, my colleague John was like, yeah, this is perfect for closure. I mean, this API, we can parse this file. Java has got this. You know, it's been doing it for decades. Um, and uh, so we can, we can import it uh, in a lazy way uh, with closure. Um, so we, we started out with dry, like a, a schema for, for the data. Um, and in order to display the values we wanted on the map, we didn't need the entire, uh, all of the property, all of the attributes on the record. Um, because there were all kinds of things on there that, uh, like, you know, categories and, you know, like other species and what the temperature was, uh, how much elevation you were on, st st statistics like that that were not immediately relevant to what we were trying to show. Um, and then after that, we, we, we could parse the data. Um, and that was, so this is an example of a citing uh, function that takes one row of, of plain text from the file um, and then builds a map out of it. Um, so that's the into line. So it starts with an empty map. And then if you kind of read it from the inside out, it's splitting the plain text row on the very last line on the tab character. Um, and then the fields that we defined earlier, we're mapping that anonymous if function over the fields um, value and the plain text row. And so what we've essentially done is we're saying, okay, we care about these, these attributes. And the ones that we don't care about, we're just gonna set to nil. And so we end up with tuples of either a schema name and a value or nil and a value. And so then the remove nil will just get rid of all the parts that are nil. Um, and so then what's left is a map of the schema name and the value for it. Um, and so we stick that in a map. So that builds a citing um, data structure for each row. Um, and then based on that, we can, we can then return a citing sequence. So it's essentially a lazy sequence which wraps the entire file. Um, so with 11 gigs of file, you know, this could get basically impossible in a, in a non-lazy language, you know. Um, so, but then closure just in, in a few lines just allows us to, you know, get this working. Uh, and at that point, once we had the schema, we needed some kind of data storage. So we went with Datomic. Um, there were some features there that we don't really need because you know this was right, basically one time right, and then just read afterwards. Um, so it was just the import that needed the right. And so you know transactions and history were not things that we that we really needed for this app. Uh, but then the still the advantage to using Datomic was the fact that the queries were awesome. They were still closure, and uh, if if you so really quickly um, so Datomic. You know, we were already we already had the schema, and it's uh, the import the data import into Datomic is all transactional. Uh, so you can basically jump from, you know, in the so you can go from a, a transaction to the previous transaction, and then you get a database as a value that you can you'll use in your code. Um, and the query language is closure, so it's so we're not using a separate SQL. There's no ORMs. Um, so we're, we're direct, and, and, the, and the query itself executes um, in the application server. So, and the results, again, are, clo are essentially closure maps. Um, so the query in Datomic looks something like this. Um, so for example, this one uh, look, looks, to look for, looks for the taxon order 2881, which happens to be a bald eagle. Um, and it's looking for bald eagle sightings in Sandusky in Ohio. Um, and uh, so the way it does that is it says, if there is a taxon which matches that, uh, that, that number, um, then store its, uh, its value in, in, uh, in or, or get the, 
yeah, get, get the entity as E, um, and then make sure that the, the state is Ohio, the county is Sandusky, and then the count for that one sighting is stored in count. Um, so, and then we do the aggregate query where we actually sum all the counts, which basically tells me that, um, so it basically takes all the sightings in Sandusky, in Sandusky for that species and then sums them all together and then also counts the number of sightings. So then we can normalize based on the number per sighting and then the total number of sightings, so we're basically averaging it out. Um, and so that would return something like 540 and 108. Um, so there have been 108 sightings, and then the total birds that were reported seen was 540. Now, you know, it's possible that multiple people uh, went and saw the same birds, right? Um, but by averaging it out like that for all the birds, we get a fairly consistent value. So the next, next uh, step was to build the web service. Uh, and for this, we chose the pedestal frame framework. Uh, and because it has you know, all the features that you would expect from a, a, a battle-tested web framework. Um, so it's got a powerful middleware, middleware system. It's got its own routing DSL. Um, and then it also allows for HTML templating. So you can specify your HTML um, as templates and then use other libraries like MLive is one of them, which, which allows you to transform that HTML uh, and pull, by pulling DOM nodes out as like CSS selectors uh, and then you know, transform values. In this case, we, we didn't need the templating part because this was gonna be just an API, it was gonna just sort of furnish JSON, but then the middleware system made serving the JSON really easy. So the query that came out of Datomic was closure maps, and then we would transform that to JSON and then furnish that. So progress so far, you know, we had the Datomic data store, we had you know, two web, what are called peers, so those are the application servers. Um, and then they would respond to an API request that would look like species slash taxon and then period, which corresponded to the month um, that we were showing. So the, the sightings would go from month to month. So then it was time to figure out how to display the data. So, so this is where D3 came in. And so what is D3? It is um, a set of uh, libraries that enable DOM manipulation based on data bindings. So when, when D3 create, that creates SVG, or I think it even supports Canvas, but most, most applications use SVG, uh, and in this case, um, there's a lot of support for displaying maps as SVG paths. Um, and so the SVG nodes it creates are bound with data inherently. Um, and then, and so in our case, what it allowed us to do is to use like the county information. So this, this map displays uh, counties and states. And so we could say, you know, this is the county I'm looking for. And from the Datomic query, we said, for this county, this is the statistic that we got, right? And so the data allows us to like look through the, or like the data binding for the county gives us the county name. And so we can look through our, our JSON data for the frequency for that county, for that species. Um, and quickly, uh, I don't know how much experience folks have had with D3 doing mapping stuff. No? Okay. So really quickly, um, so the way the, the, the way the D3 builds a map um, is by consuming a data format named GeoJSON. Um, and so GeoJSON is a subset of JSON which encodes a lot of uh, geometric information. Um, and so D3 can basically structure that and you know, basically parse that into SVG. Um, and there's another version called TopoJSON which is way more uh, informationally dense than GeoJSON. Um, and so what it does is like, it's aware of topology of the curves. So it can say, you know, if there's intersecting curves, it knows about like an inside and outside or a 
or left side or right side, and then it represents it but with only one curve. So it like condenses the data by a factor of like, you know, on large data sets, it could go up to like 80%. So like, you know, topojson is like a fraction of uh, a typical GeoJSON payload. Um, anyway, so, so we needed some way to, you know, for the web service to also send that static GeoJSON over when D3 needed it. Um, so that was, that was not through Datomic. So that was just static data. You download it once and it's just served. Um, so, but then um, displaying that using D3. Uh, so this is where we were like, okay, got ClojureScript. Um, and so there were some immediate wins for using ClojureScript. Um, it was easy to integrate into the existing stack um, because there was, there's already tooling around it for, you know, for if you're using closure stack, closure stack. Um, it's essentially the same language on both the client and the server. You're um, describing your front end in the same terms as, as your, you know, in, in the same functional way as you're uh, doing the back end. And then interoperability with JavaScript, which is awesome. Um, and in case of D3, you know, that was, that was where it started. But then it always comes down to this. It's like, so what is closure script? You know, and whenever, you know, here it's probably, I don't get kind of this kind of reaction, but like at other, other places when I mention closure script, it's like, what? Um, so it's essentially a compiler for closure to JavaScript. Um, and so, it, it, so what you're writing is actually st still closure, uh, but then the, the build tools know to compile that down to JavaScript. And not just any JavaScript, it's JavaScript that's optimized for the Google Closure library, um, which is another set of tools that allows you to do all kinds of magic on the, on the JavaScript that's emitted. Um, so anywhere from minification, um, but then it can also do something called dead code elimination, where it can, where if you provide, um, if, you, if you tell it exactly which which parts of a library you're using, it will make sure to use only those and like not concatenate anything else. Um, so your payload is really small. Um, and it has several benefits over vanilla JS because you're writing closure, you get you know, the benefits of using persistent data structures. Um, you can use object keys in your maps. Uh, you know, with JSON, you're, you're stuck with strings. Um, you, have, you can use, you, can, you have laziness. Um, you have macros. You can write functions that, that write more code. Um, you have function argument restructuring. In JavaScript, it's, it's a major pain. Um, so, you know, this, so these were some immediate wins. Um, and so, for example, uh, this is what JavaScript interop looks like. Uh, so if, if you were in JavaScript, if you were to, can, can anyone, can everyone see this? Okay. So in JavaScript, if you were to you know, declare a function, um, you can do the same thing in ClojureScript uh, as a function, and then you can use that internally. So if you see in the ClojureScript part, uh, you're calling dot .select as a method, um, uh, and the first argument to it is the receiver, um, and then the next argument is the arguments that the function actually takes. So that's very similar to how Clojure interrupts with, with Java. Um, and you can uh, retrieve properties from an object in a similar way. So like in JavaScript, you would return, say, d3.event.target. Uh, so it's a nested structure. Um, so in this case, you can use the dash syntax to pull out nested data. Or there's also a macro, like a double dot macro, that allows you to you know, go in deep and fetch, fetch what you need. Um, Fluent APIs. Um, jQuery has Fluent APIs. Um, D3 has Fluent APIs. So basically, it's transforming the result of one fun calling one function that gets fed into another function, and so on. Um, so with ClojureScript, you have the thread-first macro, which allows you to do the same thing. Um, so the result of calling JS D3 times scale can then become the first argument to the domain function on the second line, and then the result of evaluating that becomes the first argument to the range function. Um, and if you notice the JS slash D3, so the JS is the global JavaScript namespace. So any external libraries you use, 
um, will be available under there. Um, and then you can instantiate, if you look on the second line of the closure script, you can instantiate the new dates uh, by saying js slash date dot. And then that creates a new date object. Um, and then you pass in the arguments just like a regular closure function. So progress so far, we have a prototype. So we had the back end, we have the topo JSON getting furnished, we have, we're responding to API requests, we have, we have the D3 making JSON requests to the back end to fetch, um, fetch the JSON it needs. So, so, so far the client side components, we have, we have the map, we have the date slider, uh, which, which just, all it's doing is like when you go from month to month, it just requests the next payload um, from, the, from the back end. And we have the species list, which right now is just one long list of LIs. So like there's no autocomplete, nothing like that. It's just you had to use the browser find to like look for a particular species. So it was, it was a prototype, um, and it works. We were using the entire closure stack, um, but it was very basic, so it, it was very unpolished. Um, there was really no structure to the data because the data was just getting fetched ad hoc. Um, so as you move month to month, it would make a JSON request every time. You know, if it, if it happened to be the same month and it got cached in your browser, awesome. But otherwise, you know, it would wait until it fetched it every time. Um, the, there were issues on the backend side. I mean, this actually surfaced that, that our API was definitely really slow because of how we had structured our schema. Um, and then, you know, there were internally between my coworker and I that, that built this. Um, I, was, I, was like, I was like, hey, we have a prototype, it works, great. But he was like, no, 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 no. there's more we can do here. Um, and of course, it's, it's nowhere responsive. So like it was only on the large screen. You made it small, it would just not work because SVG on, on smaller screens and tablets is really slow. And we were rendering close to 3,000 SVG elements uh, because like we were rendering the county level map every time, right? So this is where React and Ohm came in. Um, and for a quick overview of React and Ohm, I, we did a workshop earlier, so those of you who, who were in that, you know, I'll, you, you've seen this before. Uh, but I'll quickly go over what it is. Um, so, mad, pretend you were in imagination land, right? Pure imagination. So, we know that, you know, DOM is, is a pain to work with. Um, and this, however, this, is an example of an ohm component. So like this is the autocomplete that we have. Um, so thinking about how we would render this or how we would build this um, using maybe you know, traditional JavaScript methods, you would probably have a list down there, you have an input field, that part is good, but then how do you match on what we've just typed out? Um, interesting. All right, for some reason it's the last way. Okay, let me try one more time. Oh well, but you get the idea. Um, so if you think about the DOM, what I mean, what the DOM would look like, you know, you probably have a UL, um, just a list of list of the species um, with allies inside of it, and then links maybe nested in each LI that point to the particular taxon, uh, the, you know, the species of bird. Um, so, and the li building the list would look something like this. You would say that you would, you know, in, ideally you would have something called a species LI, which would, which would be responsible for building that map, which represented one LI element. Um, and then you would map um, that species LI over all the list of your species. That way you get a whole bunch of LIs, right? Um, and then you would probably apply some kind of UL function over it, and then you would have what you need. Um, and then if you were to actually, you know, narrow down the species based on what was getting typed, 
you would need to store that somewhere. The match string, I mean, so the black black DHR is how far the user got, but like you would you would kind of hold on to that somewhere and then match that. So we would have a match match string function uh, that would take the species, the name of the species, and then match it on that some kind of regular expression match, um, and then filter only the ones that return a positive match, um, and then we would actually man map the species li function over only the ones that are, that came back. So, so the result of the filter is again a vector, but it's a smaller vector, it's a subset. And so we, we only map the li over the ones that, that match the filter because we don't want to render the whole list at that point. So you would probably have you know, something like a filter list items which would take the filter text that the user typed and the entire list of species, and then it would, have a, it would return a ul, um, and internally, it would basically create a bunch of LIs by mapping the species LI function. So that's, that's theory, right? Unfortunately, we don't live in imagination. Um, so this is where React comes in. Um, so what React will allow you to do is to rent, it will let you render the DOM you want. Um, and then it will take care of the details in making it show up in the browser. So it, what it builds is what's called a virtual DOM. And then it will, anytime you need to make changes to that DOM, it will, it will batch the changes that it needs to make and then push those into the browser as required. Um, and then it, it supports, it's, it's really amazing how much, how detailed it is. I mean, it, it has its own synthetic event system. So the, any events that originate in the virtual DOM, it will capture and it will give it to you so that you can implement your handlers on it, which are also, uh, which also just change data, and then your DOM reflects that change. Um, and then OM is ClojureScript's library, uh, which builds upon React, um, but then it takes, takes it one step further, because React has a bunch of heuristics that it performs to know which parts of your DOM have changed. And if you think about it, it's working with JavaScript data, which can get arbitrarily changed at any, at any level, and you would never know about it. Um, so React tries to keep uh, tabs on you know, whatever levels of data you have, and then based on that, make intelligent guesses on what changed, or what, needed to, what needs to re-render in your DOM. But then ClojureScript gives you immutable data structures. So what Ohm does is it, it, it eschews some of those heuristics and says, I will tell React when uh, something has changed. And internally, the way it handles data is through ClojureScript, as opposed to JavaScript objects. Um, and then it, it allows your DOM declaring functions to work with ClojureScript data in what's called cursors. Um, and then that allows it to keep tabs on not only what the data is, but where it is in your total application state. And when it does that, it can immediately tell whether something has changed based on a simple equality check. So like, if something has changed way down deep in a cursor, then the resultant cursor is a totally different data object. And so based on an equality check, it can say that this has changed. And so it knows to re-render all the components in that, hier in that hierarchy. And so out of the box, oops. Out of the box, you know, in, in initial tests, Ohm is actually faster than React itself, um, even though it uses React. Um, so in, in our case, um, this is what the species list would look like. Um, so it would, it, it so, the refi part returns um, an instance that knows how to render itself based on some state. Um, in our case, the state is, for example, what the user is typing in the, in the input box because we want, to, we want to hold on to that, right? But that's transient data, so like it's not something that we need to track at a global level like the species list, right? Um, the species list is something that the entire application cares about. What you're typing in that, in that data field is local to that, just that component. 
So that is available in the, in the state variable to the render state. Um, and so basically what you're doing is DOM UL is a, so the UL function is a macro that Ohm provides. Um, and so you're literally applying a function to the result of building species item function over the list of species that have been filtered down based on um, whatever the user has typed in. So this, is, this almost matches exactly with our ideal uh, implementation. Um, handling events, uh, you can have like an on-click handler. So the taxon link that we were talking about um, is, is down here on inside, nested inside the li. You can see the dom slash a. So that's, that's a link. And the href just refers to the taxons path. And then the onclick, um, essentially what it does is it uses core async, which is uh, closure scripts, enclosures, uh, way of uh, handling asynchronous events in a way that seems synchronous. Um, and so in this case, what it's doing is um, it is, so if you click on that link, what it's saying is this is the species that the user selected and it puts it on that channel. And then the app then knows that this was selected and then it knows to render everything according to what, according to the species that was selected. So at this point, this was where I was. <laughs> yeah, I was like, okay. Um, so it, but it, it took me a little while, obviously, to, to warm up to that. Um, and it's totally a different way of thinking. Uh, because if, especially if you're you know, thinking in terms of, oh yeah, my data is just gonna be what I fetch when I need it, and then like, the component that fetches it is gonna be responsible for showing it, and then other components that need that data are SOL, you know. Um, but in this case with Ohm, that's not the case. Uh, the data is canonical, it's in one place, and then the components are all that, that are interested in a particular piece of data all get that identical cursor. And then so whenever that changes, they all know that it's changed. Um, and there's a very strict API about how to change that canonical data. So um, I went ahead and built another component there. Um, and this time the, the one which actually goes and fetches uh, the photos from, from Flickr. So, so first, you know, I, I needed a way to integrate with Flickr. Um, so, so, so I wrote a quick little uh, helper, um, helper module that allowed me to do that. So, you know, there's libraries out there, um, closure script libraries that allow you to work with Flickr, but they, they're huge because they, they talk about, you know, signing in, authentication, fetching your photos, sharing photos, uploading stuff, I don't know. Like all kinds of things that the Flickr API exposes, right? I didn't need all that. All I needed was I had the string that the user entered, right? That was already part of our data. So all I needed to do was hit the Flickr search endpoint with that string and then retrieve data based on that. Um, and then Flickr, for better or for worse, it allows you, it gives you you know, it allows you to specify how many results you want, and then it even paginates it for you. So like you can say, I only want per page, you know, 20 or 30 or whatever. Um, so, but then the fallout of that is that you have to make two requests. You have to first hit the search URL and get the URL to one of those results. And then you have to hit that other URL to actually get the image data. Um, but that's it, so two requests. Um, and so, you know, and we already know the base endpoint, um, and then all we needed to do was add this huge query string with all these things that Flickr needed. Um, so part of it is the API key, um, and then, you know, among other things, right? I mean, your search terms, uh, what size image you want, the per page, how many results you're looking for, stuff like that. Um, so, I, there's this library uh, by Chaz Emerick, uh, who's you know huge in the closure community. You know he's been he's he's behind pretty much every third library out there is probably written by him. Um, and he has this tiny little 
library called URL, um, which all it is is a protocol. Um, it defines a protocol that um, that has these that basically it wraps a closure script map uh, or a closure map. You can use this library both in closure and closure script. Um, so, but what you can do is like you can specify you can give it a string, and then it will return an instance of URL, and it will decompose that string into different bits and pieces. So like, you know, the protocol, the username, password, the host, uh, the path, you know, all, all the things that you'd expect in URL. But then what's cool is that it also gives you a query string map. Um, so the, the query is, you know, a key value pairs, right? So it, it really translates really well into a, into a closure map. And so uh, the URL's query is a map. And then if you wanted to put things on that map, you just call a source. Um, and a source is basically closure scripts, uh, like a hash merge or like, you know, a way of specifying, a, adding or overwriting a key in a hash. Um, so we do that, and then if you call string on the result, so the str in the last line, that will give you the URL all put back together. So it's consistent, and if you wanted to do this in JavaScript, it would be a lot of string wrangling around, and you know, and I tried you know, <laughs> really quickly to do that and until I found this, and I'm like, three lines, and, all I, and it does all I need. Um, and so this is, the syntax highlighting is kind of messed up on this one, but um, so I'm using JS d3.json to make a request uh, to the search URL, and the search URL is a function that returns the search endpoint for, for um, Flickr. Um, and then based on that, what I do is um, the data that comes back, so, so the second argument to the, to the d3.json function is the callback that happens when the JSON, is, JSON comes back. Um, so when the JSON request is successful. So then we are calling ohm update, and we, and we basically, the model is the app state, and we are storing the first photo in my results in the app state. Um, so, and then secondly, um, we, if, if we needed, if you look, if you were, if you remember from the demo, you could actually hover over the, the picture and then click on a link and it would fetch the attribution for it, right? Um, it would actually tell you who took the photo so that you can again click on it and it'll take you to Flickr. Um, so that's, that's the second example. So where, where if you clicked on, you know, view attribution or whatever, it would actually go and uh, fetch the author name for it. Um, so this is the entire selection image component, right? Um, so it, there's a DOM image, which is the image tag, um, and there's some helpers in there, but like uh, there's a default of the loading PNG, which is like a placeholder image, uh, but then um, it looks in the model for a URL queue property, which is what we, we put in there when we go and fetch the image details from Flickr. Um, and then, then, then there's the second part, the div with the attribution, uh, which has, again, um, you know, a, a by uh, div, which has the attribution in it. Um, and again, you know, there's some conditional stuff on whether the, whether the user had clicked on it or not. Um, but, you know, it's fairly simple. I mean, you can, you can actually scan it quickly and like, you know, maybe squint a little bit and you can see the, the, the DOM declaration right there. Um, so progress so far, we have, you know, um, the same thing, but now we're actually uh, using Core Async and Ohm, and you know our our components are now reactive, and you know uh, the data is handled way better. It's more safe, um, but it's still rendering to the large screen. So now we have not only the first three that we started with, but we have actual push state. Um, which allows us to, you know, preserve our links. Uh, so if we, you know, do some, do some client-side routing based on the taxon that we click. Um, and then we have the photo of the bird. There's a header which also displays the name of the bird that was selected. Um, and then the type of head that we just saw. 
And so this um, is some of the things that are stored in the global application state. And they all affect how the app is displayed. So the current taxon shows up in the URL, but, and it's also in the links on the list. Um, the current name shows up in the header up there. Uh, this is what the user has clicked on. Um, the time period is manipulated based on that slider. Um, and then when you go back and forth between the months, the push state is updated, or the URL is updated. Um, and then the photo, and then the taxonomy is like just the, the entire list of species. So that's all over there. And then the frequencies show up on the map. Um, and all of this data is kind of stored in one canonical place, but then all these other little bits and pieces of the UI are listening to these specific pieces and know exactly how to render that. It's way better. But again, um, so we've addressed the unpolished UI. We know that the data is better structured. The database query, we worked on it, and, you know, optimized it. And Datomic lent itself really well to like changing the schema and uh, you know, partitioning the data in, a, in, in specific ways that allowed us to like, you know, we basically separated out by species, you know, so that um, all the sightings for a species were in one partition, and so we could like just get that fairly quickly. And that's what is cool about it is like uh, Datomic and Enclosure will allow you to munge your data because data is such a first-class citizen. Um, it allows you to express your data the way that makes sense for your application. Um, instead of like being locked into some kind of um, model or like some kind of object, right, which hides that. Um, with, with Datomic you can, or with, with Clojure you can massage that and like express it the way you want. Um, so now we're, we're on the same page, we're rendering home, but then it's still not responsive. So now, I hope this video works. Um, so now this is, this is what it was on the big screen, right? This is what we were seeing. Uh, but then if you made it smaller, we could still, it would still work. So this is what we want to do. And now if you look, the map is not as granular. It's not, if you're on a smaller screen, you don't probably care about county level data. Um, oh, and it pauses again. That's super annoying. Okay. Um, I could probably do this really quick. Go and doing it live. All right. So when it starts up, it like picks a random thing and then goes and fetches the photo. Uh, and you can say view attribution and it will like, you know, fetch the name whoever it's by, and then you can click on it, go to Flickr. But then for responsiveness, uh, kind of half the screen, and then it's rendering something different. Um, this is, you know, Flickr now, um, because it's, uh, right? And then you can go smaller. And then look what happened with the, with the slider, right? Now, now we have big buttons that we can, we can tap on. Um, and then you can still drag the snap around, uh, but then the layout is different. It's, it's moved you know, to this layout. Some of this you can do with CSS, right? Um, you, can, you can change where things go. You can make media queries. You can um, do that kind of stuff. And you know, those of you who've used Flexbox, that makes it even simpler. Uh, but then you you know, th there's other things that are happening though. If you just if you just showed and hid things with CSS, that still doesn't stop you from making queries. For example, the photo, right? When you each time you click a bird, it'll still go out to Flickr and fetch a photo, even though you're not showing it, right? So CSS doesn't help you there. Um, and then like, you can move things around, but you don't want your app to be making unnecessary requests. Uh, and for example, the, the county data, how does it know in, with CSS to say, okay, when I'm rendering a smaller map, don't go to counties, just show me the state level data, right? My map is tiny now. Um, so for that, it is an app level um, concern. So I, I came to the realization really quickly that, sorry, 
that screen size is user input. So when a user pulls up your site on, on a device, they're telling you how they're, sorry, they're telling you how they're using your site. Uh, so that is user input. And so your app needs to know about that. It needs to be intelligent about it. Um, so um, this is where we were like, okay, let's figure out with JavaScript how to find uh, or how to, or what size the user is viewing our app on. Um, and you know, we made sure that the, we put our breakpoints where the design actually broke. You know, when things were getting crowded or like overlapping, we were like, okay, this is where the layout needs to change. That you can do with CSS. But we still need canonical uh, places or, or, or at least application level ideas that reflect the screen size. Um, so we said roughly, you know, there's an excess which is extra small and small, medium, and large. Uh, large is just a large screen. And, you know, medium is, for example, landscape mode on your iPad. And whereas small is probably portrait mode. Um, and then extra small is the phone. So there's a library, uh, there's a JavaScript library, a tiny little one called inquire.js, which allows you to, it uses the browser's match media API and allows you to have, to register handlers when the screen size changes or like when it can detect uh, what your, you know, it can, it can use basically what looks exactly like media queries and let you know with JavaScript when that changes, when that matches or does not match. Um, so in our case, the right side is cut off a little bit, but then basically what it is is just the string, excess, small, larger, uh, or medium. So in each case, we're saying when the screen width is between these limits, call the size handler um, and, and for this size, right? And what the size handler does is, you guessed it, it will, so it's right there. It's, an anonymous, it's, a, it's a function that, again, changes the app level data and stores the screen size on it. That way, our components can then look for that string when rendering themselves. Um, so the client changes that, that we needed were, um, so that the, the components now have the logic to actually look for that, the screen size attribute as well. Um, so then the map can be smart about rendering states on a smaller size versus counties. Um, the photo does not render. There's no photo component on smaller sizes. Uh, if you inspected the inspected DOM on there, you would not see that whole that whole thing. The React just does not render it. Um, the slider changes from that big long input range to a little select box and buttons that you can toggle. Um, actually, we can look at that really quick. So when it's on um, a tiny little screen, you can you can go pick you know your, the month you want, or you can like you know go forward or backward, um, and it responds to that. Um, and then the Ajax, Ajax calls needed to change too, uh, because the map data now does not need to fetch the GeoJ or the topo JSON, even though it's small, it's still an order of magnitude too big uh, for rendering county data as opposed to state data. Um, API requests changed because now you only fetch data that makes sense at a state level as opposed to the county level. Um, but then it all turns out to be just the, that if condition right there. It says if my, if my screen size on my model contains large or medium in it, um, then use the slider. Otherwise, use the select. Right? So there are two different components, but only one renders based on the screen size. Um, and again, you know, we're not using CSS to render both of them and hide one of them. We are actually making a, a logical decision to render the one we want. Um, and server side, you know, we're, we're now passing a query parameter, whether I want county level or state level data, and then you know the query needs to handle that. Um, did you have a question? Oh, okay. Yes. 
Um, and then, right, and then the data, data log are like interfacing with Datomic to get the right data uh, aggregated. And so now we were at a place where we, we had the app we wanted and it was responsive. So we were ready to ship it. So that's all I have. And at the end of this, uh, we have like <coughs> three or four pages worth of resources. Um, so you know, there's blog posts that I've written uh, based on my learnings around this. Um, there's you know birding resources for the three people that were interested. Um, <laughs> And there's, you know, closure. There's, there's tons of material on closure. I mean, these are some of the highlights. Uh, are we there yet? Is like almost a seminal talk that talks about the ideas behind closure. Um, and then core async is another really interesting concept. Um, it takes, a, it borrows a lot from, uh, from Go, in terms of how it handles um, asynchronous code. And then for closure script itself. There's some really cool articles and videos, um, so and on React themselves, um, and then D3. Um, there's Mike Bostock has basically you know flooded the internet with examples. I mean, there's a load of stuff to look through. Um, but then Scott Murray has some really good introductions to to D3 itself and how data bindings work. Um, it doesn't talk about mapping though. Uh, for that, you would look at you know Mike Bostock's map example. Um, it, it gives you a very simple way to build what's called a choropleth, um, which is what that map is, which shows um, how statistic varies based on location. Uh, and then there's a really good example by Mike Bostock also that's called building a choropleth, a choropleth um, in which he goes from from scratch and like downloads the shape files from you know an open repository parses them using his topojson library uh, then you know creates the topojson and then you know shows it up in a in a browser and then uses a statistic to you know render it um, and then there's a site called i think it's called geojson.io uh, which allows you to play with it uh, just just to look at what that format looks like um, and that's it that's all i have Today.